I think trial and error. Yeah. I think like that's one of the key ones. We made a lot of mistakes at the start. Like I would hire the wrong people. Uh, I'll explain it to you. Yeah. So we, uh, uh, Dreams Factory, we've got a, uh, it's a merchandising company. Yeah. So we do like all the in-store, like NPD launches, like product launches, yeah. compliance, auditing. So we work with like Bacardi, um, Casella wines, they got like the biggest wines in Australia, like Grey Goose. When they launch into like Dan Murphy's, we do all their building, like displays, we do like okay. make sure products are there, their deals are in line. Yes. Um, and then we do their tastings. Have you been to a bottle shop and you see the tastings? Yeah. So yeah. Those, those are my team. Yeah. And then we also do selling. So like we help teams sell into stores. Yeah. So like okay. we have like programs running throughout the year, like cohorts where four or five brands join and it's yeah. like a cool, yeah, it's-, it's and, would you, and the reps, are they representing like- The brands. The brands. So they, they're, and they're, they're trying to sell them into stores. Exactly, they're, yeah. white, they're like white labeled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they're my team, but we get contracted out. That's good. Though. Yeah, it's a big bro. We have 200, close to 200 staff now nationally. Seriously? It's grown like a fucking beast, yeah. Yeah. But this is in liquor, like so liquor. And then we're launching Brand Factory, which is in grocery, but haven't really got it off the ground yet. Yeah. It's a, the, the thing with liquor, and I got a bit lucky to be honest with you, because in Australia, like grocery is such a big sector in comparison to liquor. So a lot of the top agencies didn't focus on, on liquor, funnily enough. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of like a cross mark or a strike force, I don't know. Mm. But these are like, th these guys are doing like 100 plus million revenue a year, but they yeah. never actually focused on liquor because grocery is like 20 times the size. Yeah. So why would you? Yeah. And because Australia is like 65% of li liquor retail is Dan Murphy's, BWS, First Choice, Liquor Land, Coles yeah. Endeavor. Yeah, all owned by Coles and Woolworths, right? Well, so this is the thing. So for them, it's like, in the independent space, they've got Metcash, which is like, you know, all your IGAs, all like your Romeos, much more money in it. And there's much more brands because yeah, yeah. they do co-funded selling. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can get 10 brands and use one person and make maybe, let's just do some basic numbers. But if you've got one rep that you try pay 40 bucks an hour and you can merchandise 10 brands, everyone pays you 20 bucks. Yeah. Fucking, you know, <laughs> you're making like, what is it, $400 in an hour to your $20 or yeah. $40, like yeah. 360 bucks. And this is one person, imagine you have 2,000, 3,000. Yeah. Yeah. So liquor's never been a focus. Yeah. So then we, I saw it as, as a bit of an opportunity and we built and we just fucking hit a, hit. It just, we're just flying now. Yeah. But there's still, there's still a lot of money in it. It's just that grocery is fucking huge and been dominated by and the big boys. A, like you said, it's such a huge gap in the market. Well, it's niche. It, it wouldn't, it, yeah, it wouldn't be worth, because they're in groceries, it wouldn't be worth exactly. their time. But for Not anyone else, it's like. So well, yeah, like we, which is like, and the margins are, are great on it. So it's, it's been really fucking good. I mean, it's been a hard journey up. It's not, it's nothing's easy, but. Yeah. As you said, right, it was just the craziest thing because it's like you think about it and it's like, I don't know, it's almost like finding a position in soccer that just ha no one even works on. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Goalkeeping. <laughs> like a fucking throw-in coach or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of those, which is yeah. like so small yeah. in, in reality, but actually still has value. Yeah. Yeah. Almost so, until you did it, they didn't think there was a need for it. The, the, the people were doing it. The difference was was that it wasn't specialized. So they were essentially using grocery data, grocery tactics, okay. grocery sellers into liquor. Yeah. But liquor is really fucking complex. I mean, like, I, I know it's quite funny, but like, you've obviously got like your spirits, you know, you've got your gins, you've got your whiskies. Like, they're super complex yeah, in yeah. terms of like how they're made and stuff going into stores and what they're selling. Yeah, yeah. But if you can have specialists that, or trade- That's the biggest thing for Dan Murphy's and BWS, they love- That specialist side of it. Exactly. Yeah. Because yeah. the amount you're driving their profit as well by actually- They don't like me though, because I audit them, the fuck out of them. So yeah. we also like call them out a lot. And like we, we work on behalf of the suppliers. Yeah. So less with, we do actually work with some independent retailers, but it's more like, give me an example, like Fella, you know Fella? I've heard. Fella Seltzer. Yeah, okay. yeah. So like they launching a new ginger beer, yeah. my team are going like to a thousand, two hundred stores across Australia yeah. to make sure that it's in the store, it's got the right ticketing, it's got the right 
promotional yeah. material on it. And if it doesn't, all of our data is live. So it goes to Fella and then Fella flick it on to, to Endeavor okay. or Williams. Yeah, yeah. So they're held accountable. So We're holding them accountable. Yeah. So they don't love us. Yeah. And we also, we also you know, again, we, we don't take money off their plate, but it's like if they're held accountable, you know, exactly. <laughs> which the, the problem is they have a problem with their compliance because they have so many fucking stores. Difficult, yeah. And it's yeah. just like you, the problem they have as well is it's it, people are so expensive. So most of the time you go to a store, like shit's out of stock, like yeah. shit's in the wrong place yeah. because it's... They're, they're, at the moment, they're dropping so many heads in stores. So it's just yeah. like something that companies almost have to do yeah. to ensure that product yeah. stays there. Mm. And yeah, it's a niche space. And then the selling as well. Like yeah. people in Australia are so expensive. And so. would you, you'd be able to choose what like Dan Murphy's use you put your products in as well, right? You don't choose. That's that's half the problem actually because really? they will give – so. The, Dan Murphy's will buy, let's say they buy, like you you start a whiskey company, they will buy like a thousand cases, yeah. but they won't tell you where the fuck it is. Oh, so, so, so you can't choose, it's like the like sales at this store are higher than this. You, and it's all on their data and that's half the problem. So if you're a marketeer and you want to invest like into tasting or you want to invest into, you don't even know where your product's going. So you have to use yeah. a third party agency to first and foremost find out where your product is yeah. And then there's the whole compliance piece to yeah. it. Is, the, is that information public or do you the, have to like request it from Dan Murphy? Well, the, the problem is it, it, the, they stopped sharing their data in 2021 because Coles and Endeavor were fighting over and independence, all three of them. Like, if you can imagine, you have like Jack's, Jack's Whiskey, which is selling amazing in these 20 stores in the Shire. Yeah. You don't want Coles or independent bottle shops to know that. Yes. Because then they're going to eat your lunch. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they stopped sharing all data with suppliers because what yeah. suppliers were doing were they were taking the data and going over to if you're working with Endeavor. Yeah. Let's say we do a deal with Dan's. I know where my stores are. I know where you think it's going to sell. Yeah. Going over to Coles and being like, hey, yeah, this yeah. is yeah. these are the stores. Fucking do me a better deal or put me in these areas. And it was becoming a massive problem. Yeah. So now suppliers are actually in the dark. And how has that affected you? Um, Has it much? Well, it's great for me. Yeah. Because you have to use it. People rely on you now. Well, exactly. Yeah. You have no choice because unless you use a service, if not mine, a service like mine. Yeah. You you can, because the, the half the problem is, right, it's back to my main point, like 65% of retail and liquor is in these chain stores. So mm. Woolies and, da- and Coles. So as, as shit as it is, you have to have your product in there because if your product's not in there, you're losing 65% of retail in Australia. You're yeah. only fighting for 35% of volume. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, it's like you, you have to use a service now even more than ever. Yeah. 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 Pretty crazy. So that's where you really got it at the right time. Because you started in 2021, right? 20, are we rolling by the way? Yeah, we are, but <laughs> for this stuff, we don't have to keep anything in. <laughs> oh, I was just rolling so that we didn't have to go back. <laughs> oh, that's mad. Um, but we can, we can kick it off. Yeah. Um, yeah, started in 2019, but it was funny. I actually started as like a recruitment agency. Mm-hmm. So I was actually, just before I went to the States, I was doing a bit of this. Yeah. I actually used to just get like mates and try and like teach them how to, be a sales rep. Because yeah. the thing for me was like, it's always been so expensive to put people on in Australia. Yes. But there's so many cool young people who like have the ability to go and sell products and yeah. want to work in liquor as well. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where that's where the idea started from. So I used to actually train people and essentially not sell them off, but put them into interviews with companies and I would have got okay. like two grand or something. Fine, fine for Jack. Fine. That's also, good. are you recording your audio? No. Yeah, okay. Yellow card. Yeah. <laughs> that's a red card. That, yellow that card. is, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so it was, it was started like that. And then, you know, we slowly kind of built, like we got our first gig with a company called Young Henry's Craft Beer Guys, mm-hmm. um, which is really amazing. We didn't make any money. Were these like lower ticket clients at the time? Um, well, these, these, this is actually a bigger ticket client, okay. but I had a connection to them. So yeah. they gave me, if I'm honest, they gave me a crack is the best way to say yeah, okay. it. You know, it's, um, we weren't very good, but we were cheap. And I think they were, they were happy to work with someone that wasn't going to cost them a fortune yeah. and to trial it. And it was really successful. Mm-hmm. Um, it was How like, old were you at this point? Probably 20. Damn, probably okay. 20 years old, yeah. I'm 23 now. Yeah, so you're also 01? I'm 01. Yeah, okay. Yeah, April. So, yeah, it was pretty it, – it, was, it was cool. I mean, like, it, it was a difficult 
journey in the sense that we really didn't know what we were doing at that point. Mm. It was just kind of like opportunity came. Yeah, yep. let me just grab it and roll with it. Yeah, and try and show your value, right? I didn't even know what really the business was at that stage. So okay. It was just like, you know, it's funny because most companies, I think, start with people. Um, you have like a base idea of what you're doing and yeah. you have people that join your team to build a company. Whereas this one was very freestyle, if I'm honest. Okay. It was very much like just brute force, like keep trying until you like keep failing, keep trying, keep failing, keep trying, get, keep going. And one, we did really well with this young Henry's company. And then mm. like the next company saw us and were like, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, they saw kind of the posters and the displays in stores. They were like, this is great. Yeah. Contacted us. Then it was like, you get the next customer and you just kind of keep rolling, yeah. you know, and people, people start talking. And especially in Australia, like I think the beauty of business here is it is a small, it's a small place. Mm. Uh, there's pros and cons, of course. But in, I guess, at least what I do, liquor is tight. So a lot of people work, you know, have worked for this company, then work for this yeah. company. Like, it's almost like a washing machine. Yeah. Yeah. So you get the connection, the relationships pretty quickly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And did you find it was easy from, like you said, training people up and almost selling them off to to almost like getting into the network in like drinks? Uh, to be honest, I think people are so complex. And I, I actually got it wrong for a long time. Um People, yeah, people are really complicated. I think that's, you know, when you look at my business, like you think it's like data, analytics, like, but honestly, if you go to the core of it, it's people. Yeah. Managing people, retaining people, recruiting people. Yeah. That is the key to this business. So I think it was, it was pretty hard because you actually, you have to build complicated systems to deal with people. Yeah. People are unpredictable and that's the problem. Yeah. Is like you can have, I can put someone on a shift in like Western Australia for a tasting, but then th their car crashes and it's like, all right, well, I'm sitting in Bondi. Yeah. It's seven o'clock on a Saturday because that's obviously a two hour time difference. Yeah. Like, how do you deal with it? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that as we've built the business, we've built processes that make things easier. Yeah. But the transition was tough. There's, again, is you know, the hardest thing is cash flow, right? Yeah. Like, that's, People are also expensive, so you've got to manage cash flow. You've got to manage like mo when, when we first started, I was doing most of the, the merchandising work. Yeah, so I was yeah. out on the road most of the time. Yeah. I still spend time on the road with reps, but now it's more kind of in a training capacity. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was complex. I think it still is complex. How did you learn those systems to manage people, or how did you find learning about that? I think trial and error. Yeah. I think like that's. One mm. of the key ones. We made a lot of mistakes at yeah. the start. Like I would hire the wrong people. You know, people would. You when you you young and I mean, I'm, there's no two. I'm still young, so yeah. I'm now a lot. I've been doing this for close to four years, at least in this whole space. Before I was running Drinks Factory, I was a sales rep myself, yeah. and then yeah. I was a national sales manager. Yeah. So uh, this space I always understood, but the the, the people element was was complex. Um, You'd naturally be naive just because it's like relationships and you probably don't. Yeah. Also, also like, you know, the hardest part of this business was actually a growth phase, probably 18 months ago, where we were picking up a lot of clients, but probably too much for us to chew off. So then you start, people have experience at other agencies and you go, oh, great. Like this person has experience. Yeah. Like let's throw them into the fire. Probably the same as like football, right? Yeah. It's like yeah, clubs yeah. Yeah. go up, oh, this, this, you know, guy has played in the Premier League. He'll be great. But they're not actually great. Yeah. They're just yeah. a has-been. Yes. Um, so, you know, I think from that, you know, what we, what we realized was we have to develop our own training systems, really strict programs, really strict guidelines. Yeah to ensure that we have the highest of quality staff. Yeah. And I think at this point, like I would openly say we have the highest quality staff in my team. Mm. And then it also comes, if, to be honest, a big thing is pay. It's just, I mean, that's life, right? Like, so we are one of the highest paying agencies in Australia. Yeah. And the thing is you pay for quality, right? So <laughs> we don't, I don't take any prisoners, like back in the day, same as me and footy. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm taking the piss, but like, yeah, it, it, it's it's like if you if you disrespect the company, myself, you're out, and yeah. there's no like second chances. And I think that's you got to be quite cutthroat, yeah, especially when it's yours, yeah. Because that's the thing, as you were saying, when you're growing too, it would have been easy to 
like the ide- the main ideology of the business, it would have been easy to divert from that when you bring so many new people in. So like you said now, it's kind of important that you maintain those standards. Yeah. Well, I think scale scale is always complex. I think that the, the biggest, I mean, the greatest thing I ever did, as I kind of said, I don't know if we we're rolling, but took my team to the Philippines. So we managed to go from a team of, I think there was pretty much four of us to now I've got like 14. Yeah. But also people make a big difference because, you know, like at the start of the company, I was doing everything from like selling to like trying to win clients to training. And it's just not, you know, I probably, it's funny because I, I never really looked at it this way. I was kind of just enjoying the journey, but it was, I mean, some days was just extremely painful, like 16, 17 hour days of getting calls from, and it's just not scalable or feasible. Yeah. So we brought in this amazing girl as our head of operations, like probably close to 18 months ago, who also is a freak when it comes to like operations, processes, cut costs. Like she's really been game changing, if I'm honest. How'd you find her? How'd I find her? Yeah. Through LinkedIn. It's always the way. Yeah. LinkedIn's it's always powerful. The way. I, I, you know, it's funny. I reckon, honestly, I reckon, especially at the start of my company, like 60% of my business came through LinkedIn. Yeah. Everyone's on it. Yeah. yeah. Some people that. aren't active. Like I, I'm a bit of a hater of, oh, I shouldn't say this, but I don't love people that consistently, I don't know if you do this or any of you guys do this, but like the people that post like three, four times a day, yeah, yeah, that yeah. kind of like in that new, I don't love that. But if you're posting good solid content, that's actually giving people output. I love that. Yeah. And I feel like I'm always looking at those people yeah. even in my head if i'm like oh i hate that person like yeah because we are jealous human beings that's just our yeah. nature you still almost have some sort of like cool yeah they're progressing like we should hit him up me with Stephen bartlett guy posts like five times a day but that's good stuff <laughs> yeah i mean yeah i've been following this alex hermosi guy now yeah. and he posts mad content i mean the thing about them though is that no one sorry those guys who are you know alex hermosi he doesn't run his Social media, they've got someone for, sure, for them. For sure. Yeah. That's almost like a different game though. Like, yeah. I think, yeah, back back to the point, like LinkedIn is so powerful though. Yeah, 100%. So powerful. I mean, that's how we got connected. Yeah, for sure. I, I saw, was I connected to you prior? I don't know. I think I saw you posting about Jack and yeah. then I was like, yeah, this this is cool. Yeah. To talk, yeah. Okay, because for me, so for context yeah, yeah. as well, Jack and I played at MacArthur Balls together. Yeah, nice. So all of my football career, uh, Crazy football career. Yeah. Youth career. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Youth career. Yeah. I, I moved to Germany. <laughs> yeah. From LinkedIn. Like I, think I, saw, I swear, I actually think I saw some of your posts. Okay. Goalkeeper. Yeah. Looking, Quite potentially. looking for a club. Yeah. I was Germany. always looking for a club. <laughs> yeah. 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 I did definitely. Yeah. Because LinkedIn, and that's even how Jack and I actually first really made contact. Yeah. Was through LinkedIn. And yeah, I always say this on the podcast, like LinkedIn is is the winner. massive. And it's also, it's also, it's free, right? Exactly. That's the winner. It's free. So yeah. like that's in business, marketing is the hardest thing because it's so expensive, but free content is just like mm. unbelievable. You can, you can message anyone. Like I've probably got a thousand messages to people that are just unopened on LinkedIn, but yeah. I don't spam people, but you also... Like before any meeting I take, like I'll know exactly where you've worked, who you are. Yeah. I'll know pretty much everything about you because there's also that yeah. psychological element to it. It's like, you know what? It's actually very much like football business. I actually see it. It's like a game. Mm. Opponent, player, you got to work out weaknesses. You got to work out what do they know, where have they worked. Yeah. It's all about relationships, isn't it, as well? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I, that's I, that's my biggest thing. I'm, I'm always, I think in today's day and age, it's really hard because people have moved away from the face to face but you know i've i won't say it on on air because there's but uh, you know we've got some tricks in our up our sleeve that we do and it just wins us clients all the time yeah. it's like very personal very like old school but yeah relationships are, are yeah, yeah. Everything. well you have to i not everything i think you have to execute and you have to perform but it will get you a foot in the door yeah yeah yeah, that's why at the start of the business, we got played out a little bit because you've got all these like, I don't want to say older, but you've got, you know, professionals that have been in their space for years. They're not necessarily, their data's not as good as you, their people's not as good as you, but they have the, I guess the, uh, 
they've got the oh, what's the right word like the experience in those yeah exactly relationships where people will choose them over a, a startup not because company. they're doing it the right way just because it's been like that for years and years well yeah that's it we we just had a recent i mean it was actually incredible how it all how it's all panned out but a really massive company we just took the account and we actually lost i lost the tender okay and i lost it to a company which we know who i just like i won't I'll never say who they are but not not nowhere near the level of ours and then funnily enough it actually fell through and we we took the account yeah which was but but it, it's crazy to think like how it, it yeah i guess relationships can drive performance yeah. what made them change from how they used to like the older people that had more experience mm. what made them was it just purely numbers that made them go with drinks factor um look now we've got a proven model so I think I think back in the day, like if we look at like the start of my kind of career, I was just a dog. Like I don't, I, I, you know, I just, I'll keep following up. I'll keep trying. I'll keep trying. I think if someone knocks on the door that many times, it will open to some capacity. Um, of course, you can't be annoying. There's what, you know, you, it's, it's selling, right? So there's a very fine balance. But again, I think, building a program that was needed. So actually looking at what do companies need? This is where they're hurting. How can we fix those problems? So building solutions tailored to all size businesses. So not necessarily just like the top companies, but also smaller businesses, medium sized businesses. Um, processes, data is important. Today, data is the winner. And then also, yeah, relationships, you know, especially in what I do, because it's so tight knit that it's like, this one recommends you. I had a guy yesterday. We did a deal with them, new company, and um, he wasn't. He, he we did one deal. There was a second one for some t tastings, and he said to me, "I got an amazing recommendation from someone else." And the, look, recommendations I think are always the the winner. Like if you yeah. can get a recommendation, that's like hundred times past a, a cold call. You're yeah. almost nine tenths away. Yeah. yeah, and that's what you said as well. It's like it's your work that speaks for itself at that point. But obviously, to get your foot in the door, it is that's probably the hardest part. Yeah, you need you need good people though, and you need A team players. Yeah. So that's what I that's what I learned quite quickly. When you bring on an A team player, you learn who what an A team player is. Yeah. And I think like you cannot you you can take a business so far or a career so far whatever with whatever you do by yourself, but you need good people with you on the journey. Because there's only so far one person has the capacity to drive something. Yeah. You know, you, you need you need the support. And I think that's the hardest thing about starting a small business is good people are expensive. Yeah. And that because there are so many aspects to it. How much control or knowledge do you still have? Because obviously it started with you training people for sales yeah. and with the data now as well. How much do you take control and how much do you let your yeah it's let, such let a it's such a good question honestly because i i've actually been struggling with it a lot recently um yeah as i said it's actually a great question because it's something that like i'm a control freak mm. so i've always got my hands in everything but i've had to learn to take my hands out the pie yeah and actually you know i think someone said something to me recently it was like Probably about a year ago, they're like, do you trust your team? I said, yeah. So then why don't you trust them? I was like, whoa, good point. Yeah. Well, until you almost know that they're 18 players or have seen, well, it's hard to know that they're capable if you never let them have the proof. But then I'd be the same as you because you care so much about it too that it's like it's a reflection on you. Their work is a reflection on you. So naturally you want to take control and... It's it's tough because, you know, especially in a business like mine where you have so many people, they are all a reflection on you. And and the thing is you always take the arrow. So if there's an error, it's my fault. Yeah. And I think sometimes it's hard for people not in the driver's seat to understand that. Um, we had something last week where I caught a few errors at like Friday, four o'clock after a lunch and I just just blew up. And I'm like, you know what? I think the thing is, is, is when there are mistakes, what I've learned is don't focus on mistakes, focus on how it happened. 
Mm-hmm. So what led to these mistakes, right? Reverse because, engineering. Exactly. Like, you know, there's no point getting angry, getting mad. We, I always fix things pretty quickly, though. So if there's ever a customer complaint, we, we don't luckily get many. But if there's whatever, things happen. Like, this is business. First time, you know, take accountability. It is our fault or this has happened. This is how we're going to fix it. Um, but I think, again, once you have 18 players, you start to trust them more. But, but people still think differently. Like, I still think differently to my team. And I say things that they hate. And I can see whilst I'm talking, they look, they're like, mm. I'll bring ideas to the party when they've got a million things on. But you also need to navigate. I think navigating people is important. Yeah. So you have to understand when to push, when to hold back, when people are busy. You know, you've got to take the kind of emotion out of it and just... Yeah. Are there certain things you look for when you're hiring people? Yeah. In terms of like uh, soft skills as opposed to their work, but more their character? Yeah, I would say one of them is one of them is their drive. So what is the reason that they want the job? You know, I think that's important. Like uh, some people just like want to get paid and I don't want those people mm-hmm. because those are the people that if they get us another job they'll take that job over what you're doing yeah. um drive they have to be a good person so we we have a lot of like rec- like we have three four stages to our recruitment and we have a phase where it's just actually learning about them even for our casual staff so I'm not the one involved in any of the recruitment but I do have the final say on yes or no. Yeah. Um, do you get a report from the Yeah, you? exactly. So like reports and then live videos. So like mm-hmm. there's four steps, but the last one's a live 10, 15 minute video. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I won't watch the whole thing, but I'll watch yeah. snippets of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that's the biggest one, their drive. And then of course, I think experience is important. Um, but I'm also very cool to take people that have the right motivation because you can always train yeah people with the right attitude right so that's yeah would you say that their their drive and their intention are related because like as you mentioned going for someone who has the intention just to make money not necessarily progress through the company or let's say have your best interest at heart if they have the wrong intention but they look to have the right drive do you think that those two things are related i think it if i'm talking about my internal team right probably stay away from the casual for this question yeah um yeah, you need, exactly. Intention is very much related to drive. You need people that buy into your vision. Yeah, That's the key thing. So, you know, it's funny. When I first started the business, my whole thought was like, money is everything. Mm. I was like, if I offer someone X, they'll 100% say yes. But then you think about it, it's like, no, that doesn't really work. Because it's like, will someone take $20,000 less a year to be happy and to enjoy where they work and to like have a good culture? I, yeah. I think yes. You know, if like you have a, a mother or whatever working for you and she wants to work at home two, three days a week, like she will take $20,000 less to be have more time with her kids than to go work in a corporate and earn $30,000 more. Mm. I think times are changing like that. So you need people that not only have their own personal drive, believe in the company's vision, and you can tell are, you know, people that you can trust. If I wouldn't have like a coffee or a beer with you, I wouldn't have you in my team. I also don't want to be with people that, yeah, uh, you know. So, so look, there are some people that are quieter and we have people like that and that's great. I got no problem. Like, but as long as their intentions and uh, yeah, which is linked to their drive is yeah. in the right place. Cool. Just going back to the beginning, because we kind of like jump straight into yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's give a bit of an intro to yourself. Obviously, I'll probably like even cut this to the beginning. Yeah, cool. Um, but Aria, I would love if you could give a bit of context to, firstly, I mean, one good one would be just how you even know Jack. Yeah, that's pretty, sure, sure. Yeah, sure. Interesting one. And then additionally, what Drinks Factory is. Mm-hmm. And then you can probably give a bit of context onto where you are at the moment, how long that you've been working on it, because obviously we, we kind of spoke about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But anything like that, that'd be awesome. Yeah, cool. Um, so yeah, my name's Aria. Um, I met, when, I met Jack probably what, 20, I don't know. Probably when we were what, 12? Younger, yeah. Jeez. 10 years ago. So we played football together in a few teams and then yeah. kind of in academies from a young age. We're always similar positions. We actually had a bit of like, not tension, but we were always competing for, for similar positions. Yeah. Um, who's better? <laughs> honestly me. 
<laughs> no, I was. I mean, there's no, but 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 I think my career capped it like 18. So he he had a much better like my youth though. I was a beast. Yeah. I also stopped growing five nine now. I okay. If I was. Don't expose yourself like that. Six foot. I'm six two. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I think we all say it. But I was a, I was huge as a kid, okay. and I was a center half, so it yeah. was great. I mean, I was you know what I mean. It's awesome. And then you kind of hit that 18 phase, and I'm kind of like I'm wasn't well. I'm probably five ten, but you stop <laughs> you stop getting to that you know yeah yeah and it's like well everyone's now so much taller and it's like coaches in Australia just want to see height yeah yeah <laughs> it's like it's just tall you win yeah so yeah that's. That's how I know Jack. Um, I went to the States to play football. I went to okay. America to, uh, yeah, college called Tiffin University. It was a subsidiary of Ohio State. Got a full ride there. Awesome. And I actually had a terrible time there. Really? Yeah, because I went during COVID. Yeah. And I, I pretty much, a uh, bit of a nut story, but I, third, I was probably the third week there. We went for a run and I just got this jab and I just, Literally, we're going around. It was hot. Ohio's hot. I don't even know Ohio, but it's it's got like hot wind. Yeah, we're running around this field, and I collapsed. Seriously, and I hit my yeah, I bang my. I've got a little cut. You probably can't see it on the camera, but yeah. Um, and I essentially got ruled out for about three to six months. They wouldn't let me play competitively. Wow, because COVID was such a crazy thing that no one knew what to do, and especially in America, they're so like yeah intense about liabilities and. So they refused to put me back on the field and it pretty much ended my college career. Jeez. So then I came back. I didn't play football for a year. I was like, I'm done. Like, yeah, mm. I think everyone's had it. Like the heartbreak, it's over. I don't want to do this anymore. Um, started and that's when Drinks Factory started in that, in that me- middle part, yeah. So did you have any background in like any type of businesses or like how, how did you even come up with the idea to start Drinks Factory? Yeah, so I didn't. Um, I'd worked as a sales rep my whole life, so since I was 18. I think, and honestly, the greatest skill anyone can have is getting rejected, and that is literally what happens mm. 99% of the times as a sales rep, especially in field. So, like, my job was to go from bottle shop to bottle shop to pub and just get rejected. Yeah. And I think that was the best lesson I ever learned, and I think that that would, like – teach anyone the most that they can experience because it's just you are literally feeling with rejection after rejection day in day out and you learn so much from that um then then look as i said to you i mean i was i was working as a a national sales manager three days a week so i was still was at uni but wasn't really sure what i was going to do when i came back from the states it was a bit of a weird period for me and then drinks factory was kind of just tickling in the back and it was just growing and growing and growing trickling through and eventually it came to the point where I had this big decision actually where I got offered a full-time job which was like super high paying for a 20 year old um and drinks factory was still growing and I just at that I don't really know why I, I don't think I was such a deep thinker then I think it was just like natural instinct yeah I just went with drinks factory and now it's it's not a beast but it's growing into a great company so at that time how much traction had you had with Drinks Factory? Mostly the smaller smaller players, you know, some of the smaller teams out there. Again, you know, I think it was, I was knocking on a lot of doors, but taking a lot of no's. Yeah. So there wasn't much traction to kick off with. A lot of people didn't believe in my vision because my vision was, again, just to make it super simple, like Australia is 65% made up of Woolworths and Endeavor. So first choice, Dan Murphy's. Yeah. My vision was to service those stores because I thought to myself, like, if 65% of Australia retail is in this space, how are companies not sending people in to check to check products are there, ranging, paid promotion? Like, no one was doing it. Mm. So I had this vision. It was like, and I actually worked for a company called Ampersand, mm-hmm. who are one of our big clients now. And they were the ones when I used to work for them, had me in these chain stores and helped me develop this idea almost said to myself, why is no one doing it? And that was my vision, to send people into these chains, drive volume, drive growth, drive compliance. And that's where Drinks Factory started. And as we started to get results, people started to take note. Yeah. And then, of course, now the business has evolved. We do assisted selling, tastings. But that's like, you know, at, at the start, I mean, there was next to no traction. I tell a story of this. Um, this is a great story. I when I used to I didn't have any money so how I used to f- recruit people was 
I used to work for other companies on contract mm -hmm. and go sell into pubs and bottle shops in different states. So the one day I was in Adelaide, I was working for like three or four brands that all pay me whatever, like 20 bucks a visit. I mean, it was cheap for them because I'd worked for a few and I was still trying to run Dreams Factory. And what I used to do is during the day I'd work for them and in the night I would go into pubs and I thought I didn't have any money to put poster ads on Indeed or LinkedIn. So I used to actually... The, the smartest thing at that time I could think of was talk to bartenders yeah. because they know liquor, they can talk, so they can probably sell. So I, I used to go from like six o'clock to 11 and just try and recruit people to drinks factory. And I remember I was in South Australia. I went to this one small, it was a distillery. Yeah. I started talking to the bartender and she was amazing, really good looking girl, like super intelligent. And I was trying to get her a job. And this old Italian guy comes, grabs me, the fuck are you trying to do? Picks me up and drops me outside his distillery. <laughs> and I mean, if, you, if, if we talk about rejection, like that is like rejection, yeah, right? Yeah. At, its, at its brute force. Because um, I was obviously trying to, he thought I was trying to nick his stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. But that's, you know, that's like the story of Drinks Factory. It's just been like a fight. And I think as you build, you just reflect on the journey, but yeah. It shows that the jobs that you had going into um, going into bars and getting that, or like you said, that rejection, you could have looked at that at that time being like part-time jobs. I'm just doing it for, yeah. like you said before, if if your motivation isn't there yeah, and you don't have the intention to really grow, you wouldn't get much out of it. Yeah. But the fact that you've learned, like th that, those skills that you learned were the basis of pretty much building success now yeah yeah well that that's it and, and and the thing is is it's like i think a lot of people now in line talk about like hard work and all of these things and i think it was something because of football which was just instilled in me i didn't think too much about working hard it wasn't something that i had like oh, i worked so much harder than everyone else no it was just something that was patterned into me from a young age you know do you see this hard work not really yeah i still don't i I think I think we're pretty soft, like the society, in terms of like how people are. I don't tolerance. It's just silly. Like yeah. everyone works hard, so I don't see it as hard work. I think yeah. like there are how many people on this planet? We're like one person. We're so irrelevant, and there's, it doesn't matter who you were irrelevant. So it's like you have to work hard to be successful in anything. Yeah, but you can't just work hard because you also have to have some strategy behind it. So there's a, there's a very clear combination. Yeah. Well, we're using the skills to your advantage, right? Like yeah. almost embracing challenges and you, you probably did it without even thinking then, but the like learning how to deal with rejection. Yeah. You've used that to your advantage. Yeah, well, I mean, I've walked like to I mean, I still I I literally walk in to some of the biggest companies in the world just me on my one with sometimes with cupcakes. And I don't think anyone else is doing things like that. But I don't, for me, I don't see, I enjoy the challenge. I enjoy the thrill. Like, you know, it's not about, it's not about what you do. It's about if you really, really, truly do believe in something and you believe in the value, you'll give it your all, you know? And that's the same thing as like employees. Like, I don't want, I, I'm happy to take someone who is way more driven way more committed to the cause and happy to learn mm. than someone with 20 years experience because I know that this person is going to give me more than, than a, someone with 20 years experience. Now, don't get me wrong, experience is important. And I think like some people that don't believe that are extremely naive because as we spoke about, like experience brings relationships, experience brings like, I guess, experiences that, you know, people wouldn't have. Um, but when you've got a vision and, you know, you, people have to align, especially, and if you, as I guess, the, not the, I don't like to call myself a boss, but as one of the team players, don't align with that vision, what is what even is a business or whatever you do? Yeah. Yeah. What would you say from a perspective of delegation of your time, hard work or let's say working compared to strategy? Is there like a split? Because like, obviously, you've got a lot of data. Yeah. Yeah. I think nowadays... Um, strategy is maybe 15 percent funnily enough i have a team that are more the strategists yeah i'm more the front the sales mm -hmm. that's really my role in this company i think when we talk about delegation that's something like when you're building 
you do everything, you wear every hat. I still wear every hat, yeah. just less than I used to. So, you know, like for example, like, you know, we have a finance team, like I have, you know, two people on the finance team that worry about what's going on there. Like I get statements, P&L statements, like you, you cash flow statements. I have an operations team. They're the ones worrying about where people are, the logistics, like travel time, yeah. whatever it is. Um, my sole role in the business is obviously to make decisions but also bring clients in. So that even in itself is delegation. Yeah, You take the hat off of operations because the thing is you, you also need, and this is a strategy in itself, like you have, you can't do everything. Otherwise you'll be working at 60% at everything and yep. you'll never hit your peak. So you have to, and this goes back to delegation, you have to let other people have some control. You can't be hands in every pie as much as our tendencies are to have them in every, yeah, every yeah. pie. Yeah. Would you say that, progressively got you got more and more trust the more skin in the game you had because obviously when you first started you couldn't get those 18 plays you couldn't pay the salaries that they demanded yeah to get to that point where you could actually trust someone would you yeah. say that was a very very slow progressive curve yeah but but more because it's more because i didn't trust anyone to okay. start off with so less less because of the money more because i've run this i started this thing and i actually don't mean to sound like narcissistic but like or that's probably the wrong word but you, when you when you build a company, you do from start do it all yourself. So it's your baby, right? Yeah, for sure. So that's more the problem is that you have this like inkling to hold on to it. So anything that you delegate out, you almost feel like, is this person or going to hold it to your, I guess, levels and your level that you you love this business. So that was the hardest thing for me. As you grow, if I'm honest, you have to let go though because there's a few things. You have experience, so you have a much cooler head. I'm much calmer than I used to be. And that's just experience, dealing with things. But then also you just cannot hold on to everything because I will go nuts. Yeah. Like if my if, if I'm looking at everything, I cannot drive what I need to drive. You know, I, it's not possible. Mm. Yeah. So that, that would be difficult to, like you said, it is your baby. So, and I don't think when you're first hiring, people, they can't care as much as you. Do, even if they have the drive, they wouldn't yeah. care as much as you and almost being okay with that. Yeah. Well, I, I've had some interesting experiences and I think now like we're very set, we've got a very strong foundation, but when you start off, you also, people see shiny objects and they drawn to them. So you also do get people that come in and want to obviously invest, put money in or want to be a part of it because they see an, individual gain for themselves which is is very hard because people are difficult to read so you've got to be able it's a, it's almost like a gut feel at times mm. is this the right person do you trust this person and what can they bring to the table because there are 18 players that you you find and that want to work with you or maybe that you can connect with but their skill set has to align with what skills your company needs. And that also can be really, really difficult at times. Because if you find an A team player that's going to offer you a lot, but they're going to clash with your team or they, they have a skill set that you know you're already driving, sometimes it's hard to turn that down if you are in the, I guess, position to take them on. But you also got to look at it as like a full team, right? Like you have call it a football team, like 11 players. Do I need another superstar? Or do I need a workhorse? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you kind of spoke about uh, letting things go. Mm. Would you say that you have more confidence in fixing an issue rather than avoiding an issue? Because you're at the point now, like when, let's say Steve uh, Jobs, when he was back at Apple, when he was in the process of, you know, getting everything up and off the ground, he couldn't control everything. And, and I actually think it was Steve Jobs who spoke about this where, mm you rely on your processes to fix things and not avoid the problem. Would you say that's at the point where you're now backing yourself to fix an issue rather than avoid the issue? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I think, I think in terms of our processes, it's less about trying to fix it. If there's something to fix, there's already a problem. Okay. So that is, that is the problem in itself mm -hmm. is, is the issue. So it almost goes back to what I was saying before, like, I don't want to fix problems. Unfortunately, like as businesses grow, there are problems that need to be fixed every day. Yeah. Because also we're dealing with people, it's not computers. So people have expectations, people are putting their own money into things. So yeah. they want results. And sometimes, you know, not to speak on any brand, but you know, you work, let's I'll give you a live example. You work with a brand, a startup company, 
and you run a tasting campaign for them, but you don't sell anything. But maybe people don't like the liquid, but I'm not in control of their liquid. I'm not in control of their marketing. I'm just in control of the execution. Yeah. So I think the key thing is understanding what is the problem. Was there something we could have done better to avoid the issue? And then very quickly, not necessarily, obviously this problem needs to be fixed, but actually reverse engineering, fixing our problems, yeah. if any were made. Sometimes, you, sometimes there, there are problems that you cannot avoid expectations or you know i think that that's the best thing so of course i, I do hold myself accountable to errors made mm. but i'd like to say that the errors made are extremely minimal and then when we do make errors it is a big problem for me and we need to work out very quickly so it doesn't happen like again. preventative measures exactly yeah. yeah exactly yeah would you sorry i, I was just gonna ask with that business model because we haven't really spoken explicitly about that what that is yet yeah for people who don't understand the full context of what you're doing, could you maybe expect like expand on the fact that if you are the middleman in this specific situation, yeah, you're reflecting both the distributor and then also the company, right? So mm. you've got to entertain both parties, yeah. and neither is a direct reflection on you whether the uh, distributor performs well or the company performs well. Both yeah. reflect you. How do you ensure, or maybe you can explain the business model? A bit yeah, more. sure. So the company is called Drinks Factory. We actually have two businesses: one's Drinks Factory, and one's Brand Factory. But Drinks Factory is our main company. Brand Factory is just launched. Um, Drinks Factory work in liquor, so we write, we do merchandising. Um, so we do all the auditing for like on the supplier end. We do in-store tastings, and then we do selling. So I, I think what Nick's saying is essentially we have a lot of parties to entertain, right? Yeah. And results are not always in our favor because of course, if you've got a, a retail bottle shop owner who does not like the product, he will not take it on. Yeah. Or if you have a manager that, I don't know, let's say for example, does not sell a lot of whiskey in a store and you're selling whiskey, it's out of your control. Um, the one way that we deal with that is through data. Mm -hmm. So all of my programs, we co-tailor with our suppliers based off previous data. So if you say to me you want to do you want to sell to 100 stores in this in this state, I will give you a list of the 100 stores based on my previous data. So okay. if these stores have been successful, this is where I'm going to attack. The problem is is when you come in from a supplier and we're getting lists, then you don't know you 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 obviously can service those lists, but you know that the results can go either way. I mean, you just don't know, right? It's a 50-50. Mm. Of course, you we do run programs like that and a lot of them are very successful but again we don't have the power to influence the promotional deal that we're offering or it's very much what they say we are the clients and we just have to if they want to offer a promotional deal or we'll give them a cap it's on them um i think the i think the key thing here though is honesty and transparency so if something's not working just being honest being blunt yeah if we didn't do a good job we didn't do a good job and I'm going to tell you that straight up, you know, if your product's not working, of course, I'm not going to tell you your product's not working, but I'm going to say, look, we struggled because the retailers weren't liking the liquid. You've also got a reflection point in the data that yeah. makes it also. Well, that, and that's the thing, the data is very difficult to argue with. Yeah. So, you know, th that's a key thing for us is like, I can quantitatively see my team's performance if it hits our KPIs, we are performing. If it doesn't, then I can reflect and say we're not doing well enough. But we do have measures in place to ensure that reps are performing as well, yeah. such as like feedback mechanisms, live reporting dashboards on individual performance. So I can quite literally log in and see how people are performing, put that against my company KPIs and say, he or she is not doing a great job. Give her another, him or her another shot or goodbye yeah respectfully it's you're not working for us hire someone else and that's what i was saying earlier like we are super cutthroat in mm. terms of like data doesn't lie unfortunately so we, we you know if it's not working we we take very quick measures to make yeah. sure corrective actions to make sure it works yeah yeah and when you first started yeah 2021 yeah bootstrapped everything was personal capital all sweat equity yeah what was that like? And when did you first start to get revenue? Yeah, so we, yeah, I never, yeah, so all bootstrapped. Um, we just, all the money was from sales pretty much. Okay. So, so you had direct revenue from the get-go as soon as you started really working? Yeah, but we were breaking even for the first like 
two years. Two years. And, and even even today, um, we're now profitable. Yeah. But only, you know, this this finance oh last financial year we, we were profitable. This financial year will be ex- profitable okay. like, at a good level. Um but growth is expensive, mm-hmm. you know, bringing on people, bringing on new systems, automations, and also like the bigger the companies you work with, the larger scale programs you get. Mm. So one of the tough things in Australia is also payment terms. And I'm sure all businesses deal with this, but a lot of the bigger customers are on extremely long payment terms from retailers, from Woolworths, Coles. So they only get paid in 60 days. Yeah. So one of the reasons that small businesses fail very frequently in Australia is because as a small business, if you're on a 60 day payment term, with which is majority of the big players, who are going to give you the two hundred thousand dollar campaigns? You have to essentially pay your staff throughout the program, which could be a six month program, and then get paid on sixty days from completion. Yeah. So you're almost looking at, you know, you could carry a hundred thousand dollars worth of costs, and then only get paid, call it two months after the completion of the campaign. And yeah. that's why it's very difficult for like companies in my space or any agencies to succeed because you. you There's you, no room for failure. Well, also a hundred percent, but also you cash is. I mean, you in order to play with the big players, you have to have cash. You know, so we've we've been, I guess, somewhat lucky in the sense that we've had a gradual growth. It wasn't like we picked up a massive player to get go, and then I had to carry. You yeah. know, it's been sporadic. You're always able to over manage it, like exactly. Sorry. But I wasn't. I have. You know, I, I still don't pull a salary. Okay. Yeah. I, I could, but do you know what I mean? Like you, you invest everything back into it. So yeah. you invest it into your people, into processes. Like, of course I could pull a salary, but it's, it, you know, it's back into the business because it's still growing. Yeah. It's still at that stage. And you're managing your overhead pretty consistently through the slow growth, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we are, yeah, we are, it's probably pretty fast growth at this point. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've again. I have an amazing team. We are that's super sharp with our costs. I know we know what's coming in, coming out. Mm. We've got a finance team, so we really dial into that. Um, again, I think the hardest thing in this country is like terms and cash is hard, especially yeah. right now. Like the economy's in a recession, or well, it's close to being in a recession. So yeah, in people, Australia, it's not great. Exactly. So people are spending way less than they used to. Consumers are, you know, if you go to a liquor retailer, you're more likely to mm. pick up a $50 whiskey than a 70 to save $20. I mean, everyone's had the same experience where you go for that cheaper option. Yeah. So what do you think happens on the flip side with suppliers? Same they're thing. Also, well, yeah. 100%. Like they're, they are making less margins. They're having to drop their price. So they're spending less in marketing spends and advertising spends. So you, you, you also need to look, and this is a mistake I made early on in my career. You also need to know how much you can chew. Mm-hmm. So I will openly say like early on in this business, we took on a campaign that I did not have the capacity to take on and yeah, it was right. an absolute failure. And I learned so much from it. Mm-hmm. And it was like horrific and I still cringe thinking about it. Yeah. And the truth is, is that you also have to put your ego in check and you can't see the money and be like, let's go. Because you've got to be like, do we have the capacity? Do we have the staffing? Because your reputation is more important than anything else. Very good point. And if you if you if you capitalize on your reputation in a positive manner, you will drive your business to incredible heights. Yeah. But if you try and grow too quickly, you're gonna have a big problem. And we were very fortunate that, you know, I we were able to come overcome it. You know, we offered them additional free campaigns. We probably lost like Thirty, forty thousand dollars on that campaign. Yeah, well, but I was happy to bite my ego, yeah. take the loss, yeah, because that's that's how business works, right? And it was it was it was a young naive mistake. Yeah, very interesting point because in 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 your sector, I mean, it is B two B, right? Although yeah. those yeah. guys are B two C. Yeah, so you're literally just being the middleman in there, bridging the gap, making yeah. it easier for them to be more B two C, and. You're able to take the blows, but you're right. Like that, that example is really interesting. Yeah. Because you then have to reflect and figure out how you can then make sure next time. Okay, yeah. Check your ego. Okay, maybe I can't take it, yeah. or maybe we got to fix the team. We got to get more people mm-hmm. so that we can afford to do it next time. Have you had any other situations like that? That was the worst. Um, 
at the moment, to be honest, no, because I've we had, we had massive change. Okay. Um, you know, I think as well that that experience was daunting, and I and I know from a, a, a I'm quite a emotional, not emotional person. I think like I care about suppliers and brands. Mm-hmm. Whereas I think a lot of agencies don't actually have that love. So it's just like get the cash in and out. And we've actually taken a lot of business because we care. Um, but that experience for me was enough to, to, to realize, okay, you take what you can take, you take or at your capacity, mm. or you find ways to drive growth quicker, which is what we've done. Yeah. Going to the Philippines, key example, like taking a team from Australia where I had four, could not drive any more growth to having an they're still all work for Drinks Factory. We have a, a contract there. So, you know, we got 10 staff working full time in the Philippines. I got three in Australia on Australian salaries, which obviously a lot higher. Are these market, like marketers or graphic designers, things like that? They do. No. So they do, for example, like our recruitment. They do our okay. schedule uploads. They do our building training courses. They liaison with representatives. They do pretty much they do everything. Okay. All right. So they all my back end systems. Yeah. But that's the way we've been able to scale at such a fast pace is mm-hmm. first of all of course i mean it's a lot cheaper than australia outsourcing yeah. to the philippines for them it's still a really fantastic salary so i i i don't agree with people that kind of come at it like oh it's not because the for them the salaries that they're on is fantastic yeah um they're still supporting their family kids they're super grateful to be there um super hard working and loyal is like another you know, so loyal interesting and I, I i do find with australians not to categorize like Aussies like this is probably all Western society but yeah. people do often chase dollar bills rather than having loyalty to a company and of course I think we all naturally want to make more money I think that's ideally everyone's goal but I think in the Philippines it's a different culture it's more family culture it's more they stick for they stick with companies for a longer time that's also a big pro- a, a big problem we had is like the turnover of staff in Aussie was quite big because obviously bigger companies, there's a, there's a lot of room to go. Mm. So you can imagine the training and recruitment process is extremely expensive. So you've now also got to bear training someone new, but then the cost as well. So it's just like you look at it and you're like, well, you can build an amazing team with culture if it works for what you do in this space give you 110%, you can scale the hell out of your business because you've got more heads and more hands working on things. And they're great people and you also are supporting them. So for me, it's been a game changer. Which brings it back to why character. Like you said, when you're hiring is so important. Like you said, you don't want turnover to be high because ultimately it's a cost for the business. 100%, I think, yeah. And, and, And that's the thing, you know, my biggest, my biggest thing is keeping my Asian players. So, what what someone taught me once upon a time, I won't say who, but they taught me again that like money isn't everything and I got that wrong for so long. And I think that's a pretty bad trap to fall into because the second you start thinking like that, you actually forget about the person and you forget what their needs are, what their wants are. But, but then again, it's it would have been easy to think that because that's a quantifiable term. When you're definitely in the growth phase, I can imagine like naturally you'd have imposter syndrome as like, Go yeah. to the big suppliers. It's almost you. You almost need that money as the proof, as like yeah. I'm doing the right thing. Yeah. How did you deal with? Did you have imposter syndrome with that? And did you do? How did you deal with that? Um. Yeah, I was probably too naive to have imposter syndrome. If I'm so honest. Yeah. I really didn't ever think of that. I just. It, it was more. It was more a case of like sheer determination, and I really. I think you have to, I really enjoy rejection, weirdly enough. And I think you have to love it. Yeah. You start to actually want to get rejected. It's the craziest thing in the world, but you almost, you are so motivated when someone rejects you to prove them wrong that you just get this spark in you that's just this flame, which is uncontrollable. So the money element for me was never like, these guys are bigger than us, or it was more, our systems are more powerful than them. They've been around for 30 years. We've been around for three and we're changing the space. Yeah. That's how we. That's how it was. So, and again, I, I took the whole approach away. The way I view it is not on, the, the thing is companies are built on people 
I'm now trying to build a business on data. Yeah. So as tough as this sounds, it's just the reality that people are somewhat irreplaceable. No one, even myself, I'm replaceable, right? But if you can build data systems that can co-align with what people need, data won't lie to you, but people will. Yeah. So that is how we prove it to businesses. It's like, this is what we can show you. It doesn't matter if my best representative in New South Wales leaves me tomorrow, this data is going to be the same. But a lot of these agencies are so reliant on their people that it causes them really long problems, long-term issues, yeah. You mentioned about the turnover for staff yeah. in Australia specifically. That's one thing I also very much agree with you. Like in, in my app that I'm working on, yeah. people are much more uh, okay with leaving something when the culture is not necessarily there yeah. yet because there's a, better, there's a better opportunity around the yeah. corner. You mentioned the 18 players. That's your priority to keep them on. How do you yeah. incentivize them? Um, there's a lot of ways. I think... The first one is understanding the individual. I mean, everyone's different, so everyone wants different things. You know, some people, some people want monetary, some people want like growth within themselves. So investing in like external training programs mm. for them, or investing in things they like. You know, we do things such as like monthly awards where yep. I send people gifts for you know dinners, whatever it is. Um, Again, I, because I've got a small team, it's a lot easier to facilitate yeah. independent and I know who wants what. Um, I think the other thing is giving people, not micromanaging. Okay. So uh, That would have been tough to get over for yourself, right? Yeah, I still do it though. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I try not to. Yeah. So I think that's, that's a, at least my team have told me that's a key. Getting, I do this thing every month, which is called 1010 with every single staff member. Okay. So it's 10 minutes of feedback. I give them yep. and 10 minutes of feedback they give me every single month. I like it. Um, I also do an anonymous questionnaire, yep. which is on the company. It's about the same thing, yeah. Yeah, and I get rinsed every month. And yep. It's great because at least I've got some 360 feedback yep. into what I'm doing wrong and right because I'm not perfect, you know, and I think I make mistakes and so does my leadership team. So it's really good to get feedback. And I think people care for their voice to be heard as well. Yeah. So that's a really big thing. I mean, one of the big things in the Philippines is most of the time, and, and again, I, I say this with a grain of salt because I don't know, I'm not using any primary example, but at least the staff that we have in a lot of the companies they've worked for, their voice is almost like silenced. It's just that culture there where yeah. it's very hierarchical, whereas we very much want everyone's opinion. I don't mm -hmm. care if you're like our lowest paid, it doesn't even, money doesn't even matter. What your position is is the better way to say it. Like, your opinion is so important and that is a way to create people yeah, value, I guess, as well, yeah. Mm, awesome. Well, I, I'm aware of the time, Aria. You've okay. probably got ahead as well, What's right? the time? 10, 10. Oh, that's convenient. 10, 10. 10, 10. 10, 10. 10. I've got, I can, yeah, five minutes I got. Yeah, fine. all right. So it, this, this camera as well, we've had it before where it just- um, Dies. Not dies. There's enough battery on there, but the SD card runs out. So cool. aware of that. But Jack, did you have any other questions? Um, probably- in terms of your time, how do you manage? Do you find it difficult in terms of how you manage your time day to day? Um, everything's in my Google Calendar. Yeah. So I set it out. I start on Sunday, set it out for the week. I have an empty calendar though. And the reason I have an empty calendar is because I have an amazing team. Mm -hmm. So my calendar needs to be empty because I need to go to the beach now. <laughs> 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 uh, I, 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 I need to, for me, I need time to think and I need time to sell and I need time to call people and I need time to do what I do best, right? I can't be locked into meetings all day. Yeah. But then if you look at my team, their calendars are full with meetings, Yeah. right? In terms of my time, I, I do have time. I'm always working though. I'm never not working. Even on Saturdays, Sundays, I'm working. Yeah. I'm not necessarily always at a desk though, but I'm always, I'm, I'm working. I think... For me, it's I don't really view time as like a concept of like a nine to five day. It's just I may call it or have a call, have a coffee with someone from like two to three, um, maybe on a Saturday. So time time is okay. It's obviously super busy. Like to, I think mean, my phone's probably gone off twenty times, and like I it is super super busy. Yeah. Um, but the, the best thing, the Google Calendar changed my life, if I'm honest with you, because yeah. you structure your day, you know what you need to get done, 
And then obviously, if I have to be in meetings, great. Otherwise, I'm in my office. Because you know? like you said, it's you almost need that time because if you were so, if you had your all the different hats on and had to deal with all the small problems, what got you to where you are now in terms of the sales and like the big ideas and kind of like your personality and your, yeah. like the, that ultimately drove the business in the growth phase. If you lose sight of that, I think it's probably a fine line. You probably need to keep. Yeah. Well, you make mistakes, right? We all human, you can't remember everything and anything. So you make errors. And like I have, I mean, I'll tell a funny story. Like I literally was so hectic last week. I sent a quote to someone, I got the numbers all wrong. But one of our big customers sent, and this is so, don't ever do this. He sent it back to me. I sent it back to him again and it was wrong for a second time. I mean, that is beyond embarrassing. Mm. What was the learning? I was just, it was Thursday, five o'clock. I was trying to close the deal, but I wasn't focused. And that was because I had too much going on. And, and the learning lesson from it is slow down. You need, I, you need time, especially when you're trying to drive something to have the ideas, you know, to drive the innovations, to speak to people. These things are so important. So yeah, I think time is immeasurable. But if you can try, at least if you're in a position where you can kind of drive your growth um, by not letting others do it, but by being strategic with your time, it's important. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Amazing. Well, all right. As I kind of said with the time wise, Ooh, no worries. We do want to finish off with one last question, though. Yeah. And that is what are three ways that you sculpt yourself every single day? Whether it's uh, taking purposeful time to go to the gym, yeah. reflection, what are three ways that you sculpt yourself? Yeah, so gym, um, my train at uh, the Yard uh, Double Bay CrossFit. Yeah. So I listen to a lot of podcasts. I think that's like the best way of learning. Mm -hmm. Podcasts are huge. 1.5 speed. There was a, this guy, mentor of mine, Troy Truen, got a, um, a podcast called Grow a Small Business. I love it. Speaks to like like minded individuals. And a lot of the times we hear podcasts of people that are the top top of their game but yeah. not small business owners trying to drive so you almost can't relate to these yeah but this is very much australian day-to-day -day driving businesses real um and the third the third way is family time i think that's important yeah amazing cool all right great to do this with you awesome. i really appreciate yeah, it was a great part thanks so much thanks awesome. for coming on cheers thank you bro thanks man. that was cool yeah awesome stuff very nice awesome cheers stuff. bro we'll that grab was great. the mic off.